Welcome to Focus, a program produced by the Department of Disaster Management, DDM. I am your host, Viona Alexander-Smith, DDM's Information and Education Manager. In this edition, we will look at the Zika virus, which has become a health concern issue for authorities around the world, and particularly in Latin America and the Caribbean. The virus is spread to humans who have been bitten by an infected Aedes aegypti mosquito, and on February 1st, Director General of the World Health Organization, WHO, Margaret Chan, declared Zika a public health emergency of international concern due to its rapid spread and suspected link to abnormalities in the brain and malformation of newborns. Stay tuned to this channel because when we come back, you will hear from local experts and find out about the local response efforts towards the Zika virus. There is no vaccine to prevent Zika. The best way to prevent diseases spread by mosquitoes is to avoid being bitten. Protect yourself and your family from mosquito bites. And here's how. Wear long sleeve shirts and long pants. Stay in places with air conditioning or that use window and door screens to keep mosquitoes outside. Apply insect repellent as directed. If you're also using sunscreen, apply sunscreen before applying insect repellent. If you have a baby or a child, do not use insect repellents on babies younger than two months of age. Dress your child in clothing that covers arms and legs. Cover crib, stroller, and baby carrier with mosquito netting. No mosquitoes, no bites, no disease. Mosquito control is all of our business. Let's make it personal. A message from the Ministry of Health, Government of the Virgin Islands. Welcome back to Focus. We're talking about the Zika virus, which the World Health Organization predicts could infect up to 4 million people in the Americas this year. The outbreak began in May 2015 in Brazil, which has been hardest hit by the Zika virus. To date, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, has listed up to 30 countries and territories with active Zika virus transmission. The listing includes Jamaica, Barbados, Puerto Rico, the Dominican Republic, Haiti, Martinique, Guadeloupe, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. There are no confirmed cases in the British Virgin Islands. With us today is Medical Officer of Health in the Ministry of Health and Epidemiologist Dr. Ronald Georges, who will spend the next few minutes with me talking about the Zika virus, its origin, and what we need to be concerned about. Dr. Georges, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. We have heard about dengue uh, for many years, and then in 2014, chikungunya surfaced. Now, Zika. How are these viruses developing, and how can it be carried by the same mosquito? Right, very good question. Now, um, most of these viruses are what we call zoonoses. At least they start out as zoonoses, meaning that they are viruses that initially exist in other animals, not man. So, for example, the Zika virus was actually first identified in 1947 in monkeys. Mm -hmm. And the name comes from the forest in Uganda where it was first um, identified. In the early 50s, the first case of Zika transmission in humans were, was, was identified. So in, in um, areas where you have you know, populations of, for example, monkeys and humans where, who may cohabitate or they may uh, come into close contact, you have these instances where viruses can move across species from one species to the next. And as you know, uh, monkeys are primates, we are primates as well, so there are a lot of genetic um, similarities between um, primates and humans, um, mon the monkeys and humans. So it first identified in 1950s in um, humans. And you know, not really that important because at the time, because really just causing a mild illness mm -hmm. and sort of, sort of complicating other outbreaks, um, dengue, malaria, etc. Right, because um, the symptomatology is, is quite sim um, similar. Mm -hmm. However, we can fast forward to the 2000s, mm -hmm. and uh, Zika has made its trek around the world. 
Uh, you could imagine between the 1950s and the 2000s, there's a lot more international travel, a lot more movement of cargo and people around the world much faster, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, with international travel and trade, etc. So these viruses can then make the transitions from where they originate and spread across the globe. So we can jump to 2050, you know, 2015 when the outbreak um, in Brazil was identified. Okay, yeah. but now that we have a better understanding of where the disease came from, why should we be concerned if the symptoms are expected to be mild? Right, because previously uh, the you know, these additional complications, etc., were not really um, noticed. Mm -hmm. But since the, uh, the large outbreak in Brazil, there has been a suspected link between uh, Zika and microcephaly, mm -hmm. and more recently, looking at um, Guillain Barre. Mm -hmm. So these are potentially very serious um, complications, mm -hmm. which then raise the profile of Zika, make it a lot more important from a public health standpoint. Okay, you mentioned those linkages and there have been several speculations about them. Should people still be concerned at this stage? Well, definitely, because there's so much unknown. Mm -hmm. right, so initially, you know, we heard that there were several cases, you know, thousands of microcephaly, supposedly unexplained. Uh, there was an article actually published last week in The Lancet, which mm -hmm. showed that there's a significant measurement error based on the definitions of a suspected case of our microcephaly. And then subsequently, when more clinical investigation is done, you realize that there are a lot fewer cases. But even that being said, uh, it's, there's still, an, associate, there's still a, you know, an increased number of cases have been observed, uh, mostly in Brazil. And then in you know, Colombia and other countries mm -hmm. have also recognized that um, Guillain-Barre has also cropped up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So definitely, you know, we don't know what the true linkages are. Yeah. Um, Zika might be associated, it might be on the causal pathway, there might be some other confounding factor. More recently there's been some, I won't call it evidence, but some speculation that some of the larvicides might mm -hmm. actually. So there's a lot of unknown in there. But what we do know is that there have been some increased cases of, of uh, microcephaly. Mm -hmm. So yes, it's something that we need to be vigilant about. Right, so hopefully very soon we can know for sure if the, the linkages are in fact correct. Well definitely it'll take time because I mean to, to um, identify causality, mm -hmm. it's actually not just, just simply to say well, well we see something and we see um, like high, high levels of Zika in cases of microcephaly. You actually need to look at the association mm -hmm. because they also, if you have an outbreak, you can think that um, infants without microcephaly can also have Zika infection. So we actually have to see an increase in the ratio. Mm -hmm. And then there's a number of other things, you know, to identify causality. It has to be plausible. Um, you know, there has to be uh, like a biological link has to be identified. So it would probably be some time before all of those things are elucidated. Okay. And we have uh, concrete evidence on the link between Zika and microcephaly. Okay, so at this time, while we're dealing with this level of uncertainty, of course, uh, the traveling public, and in particular pregnant women, are concerned. Um, what advice would you provide for them at this point um, if they're considering traveling to a region where Zika infection is present? Right, so basically, um, the, the Zika virus is transmitted by the Aedes aegypti mosquito. So is dengue and chikungunya. We're aware of the serious complications of dengue, mm -hmm. and um, most of the Caribbean, most of the region are, as well knows the sequelae of chikungunya. It's the same mosquito. So primarily what persons need to do is to avoid being bitten by mosquitoes. And there's a number of things that they can do you know, to protect themselves. So, it, so that, that would be one of the initial things that anyone coming to the region, whether pregnant or not, mm -hmm. should consider. Uh, we, a number of countries have, have identified that there are actual cases and so that they've confirmed this local transmission. Okay. The BVI not, is not one of those at this present time, but I mean, as I'm saying, definitely persons should take those precautions to protect themselves from mosquitoes. And we, of course, have to take action to um, prevent not only Zika virus, but chikungunya and dengue. Um, you spoke about avoiding uh, mosquito bites, bites. What else can we do to avoid the transmission of uh, Zika and other diseases right. carried by mosquitoes? Right, so definitely. So I'll start from the individual perspective. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we're looking at the Aedes aegypti mosquito. Um, thankfully, uh, we don't have the other species of Aedes mosquitoes okay. in the territory. So we're looking specifically at the Aedes aegypti mosquito, which is a bite, it usually bites around dusk and dawn. And it's a, we can call it a domesticated mosquito because it doesn't live in the marshes, in the mm -hmm. bushes, in the forest. It lives around our properties in, and breeds in clear water 
which in um, containers that we leave around our property. So first thing that an individual can do to protect themselves, um, we know that the mosquito bites mostly around dusk or dawn. Mm -hmm. So around, the, around those times, you can wear long clothing and also use uh, a variety of um, mosquito re repellents. Right? The okay. number of them are available locally. They may contain DEET, citronella oil, and a number mm -hmm. of other um, uh, re mosquito repellents. So from the individual, individual perspective from pre preventing bites, that's one thing you can do. Also, um, mosquito treated, um, sorry, insecticide treated bed nets is another op op um, thing that persons can use, mm -hmm. particularly persons who may be sick to prevent um, spread of infection to other persons, they can actually sleep under mosquito treated bed nets. So that's on the individual level. Now, as we mentioned, the mosquito right. and the mosquito breeding, um, most of the interventions have to be, have to surround dealing with mosquito breeding. Uh, so from the individual perspective, the homeowner, the, um, the person who is renting an apartment or renting a house or living in a property, simple thing you can do is a weekly inspection of the property, mm -hmm. right? And we know from our experience where, what are the usual, um, you know, s suspects, the usual suspects. So we're looking at, for example, cistern covers need to be covered um, tightly. The cistern overflows need to be protected with mosquito screens. Um, mm -hmm. Things like gutters, which right. can get um, clogged and trap water, clear uh, rain water, need to be make sure that make sure that those are, are cleaned out. Um, just normal pots, um, containers, buckets, barrels, things like those mm -hmm. should also be secured. So these are the kind of things that individuals can do on on their own. Um, from our experience as well, construction sites are another vulnerable place because in construction mm -hmm. sites you tend to have a lot of barrels buckets for mixing concrete for um, collecting water. So these as well need to be secured. Um, you may also have unfinished structures, you know, mm -hmm. like roofs, um, cisterns which haven't been covered as yet. And these are all areas where water can, um, can accumulate and um, mosquitoes can, can, can breed. Dr. Georges, thank you so much for joining us. You have given us quite a bit of information that will be useful. Okay. We'll be back after this break. Okay, so here's the 411 and Zika virus, dengue fever, and chikungunya. For those of you who may not know, it's the same fight. The same mosquito, the Aedes aegypti mosquito, can give you Zika, dengue fever, and chikungunya. There is no vaccine or treatment for these viruses, so your best defense is a great offense. Protect yourself at all costs. Start with ensuring that you are not breeding mosquitoes by conducting weekly inspections of your property to identify potential breeding sites. Avoid being bitten by mosquitoes, period. Wear long and loose clothing and use mosquito repellent products. No mosquitoes, no bites, no disease. Mosquito control is all of our business. Let's make it personal. A message from the Ministry of Health, Government of the Virgin Islands. Welcome back to Focus, where we are discussing the Zika virus and what we can do in the Virgin Islands to protect ourselves. Joining me now is Acting Chief Environmental Health Officer Yolanda Penn, who will speak about what we need to do to reduce the mosquito population in the Virgin Islands. Thanks for joining me, Ms. Penn. Thank you for having me. The growth and reduction of the mosquito population has a lot to do with the natural environment. Explain to our listeners the link between the natural environment and the mosquito population. Okay, uh, well that's, there's a lot of different ways to answer that question, but there are many different types of mosquitoes and some thrive in the natural environment, whereas others would thrive in the human environment. Mm -hmm. And it just so happens that the Aedes aegypti mosquito thrives in the human environment because uh, there was actually a study done of various species of the 80s and it was found that the Aegypti prefers human blood to the others. So uh, they would thrive in the human environment and they prefer to bite humans and they thrive in preferably clean water. Mm -hmm. And we're oftentimes storing water or we have various containers around our household that could collect water. 
So it's an ideal environment for the Aedes aegypti mosquito to breed. Right. What measures have been implemented by your department or will be implemented to help reduce the mosquito population here? The control of mosquitoes is a day-to-day -day operation mm -hmm. because within the Environmental Health Division you have the vector control unit, which is, that's their charge. Um, mm -hmm. And our vector control officers would conduct daily um, surveillance and inspections of premises. And of course, all of our uh, ponds and drains are checked weekly by the vector mm -hmm. control officers. But in addition to that, um, with the um, heightened alert with Zika, mm -hmm. um, the Environmental Health Division, in collaboration with the Ministry of Health, various departments in the Ministry of Health, as well as other government departments, um, have devised um, or kind of formulated a Zika plan. Mm -hmm. And that plan involves um, heightened surveillance and inspections door to door in high risk areas, as well as um, it is a outreach promotion where in addition to going door to door, like um, in normal regular circumstances, um, the vector control officer would only leave notices for high risk premises. But in this case, um, we're going to be going door to door and um, trying to have a conversation with all householders, whether they're high risk or not, leave the checklist with them, a brochure in their hand, something that they can use for a weekly guide to do their own inspection of their premises, okay. right? Um, the plan also involves um, some repair work. We're going to uh, try to start off with a supply of screens and wire mesh so that we can actually cover some of the minor problems that we may come across, maybe an open water container or overflow pipes from a cistern that we could just simply cover on the spot or even show a householder how to do it, you know, just to kind of speed things along. Okay. Are there any communities in the Virgin Islands with a particularly high mosquito population? Yes. Well, on any given day or at any given time, you're going to have a, an area that has spiked or has become high risk. Mm -hmm. Um, that is because if you have a community with several containers that may just be there and they're dry and there may be a period of drought, but once the rain would come for a couple of days, all of a sudden that area has now become high risk, right? So at any time, any particular area could become high risk. So I would say that all areas need to remain very vigilant mm -hmm. as far as keeping their areas clean. However, to answer your question, <laughs> right now um, we do have, uh, we could say that the area between Parakeeta Bay and Boggers Bay, more so Boggers Bay, would be the high risk area right now as well as Joe's Van Dyke. Okay, so of course extra surveillance yes, will yes, be done in that right, area. Right, and the plan I just spoke of, our efforts will begin first to focus in those areas. Okay, mm -hmm. so some of these efforts have not really been implemented yet? Well, yes, yeah, some have. Okay. Uh, actually, I forgot to mention as well, training, Okay. because that is part of the Zika plan. It's always been something that we've offered, but now we're trying to, um, I guess, put it out more that we are offering training. Okay. And what I mean by that is, um, it's part of a, an integrated strategy. Right. Uh, ma an integrated management strategy, IMS Dinge. Mm -hmm. um, so what I mean is, for example, we have reached out to um, the Ministry of Education. We've already shared our checklist mm -hmm. to be uh, distributed to all the principals of public, private, secondary, primary schools right. so that that information can be shared. And we've asked for school principals to identify a maintenance person or a groundskeeper that, could, that we could train. Okay. And what would happen is uh, the vector team would go to the particular school and that those individuals would accompany the vector control office officer on the premise inspection and they would be advised as far as um, their unique environment mm -hmm. what to look for where the problem spots may be right right and so um, in addition to that we've reached out to the hotel industry through the okay. tourist board to identify people on various properties that could be trained as well Great. Of course, reducing the mosquito population is everybody's business, and that's evident based on what you've been saying in terms of reaching out to different sectors. How do we or how can we play our part to bring about this change within our homes, schools, 
and place of work. I okay. know you've touched on it, and you touched on it a bit, but yeah. I want you to go a little deeper for me. Okay. Okay. Well, for homes, a mosquito is a pest, just like mm -hmm. any other unwanted um, thing in your house. But yes. There, you know, like rats and roaches and stuff like that. So it's a pest. So for households, uh, I would say we need to make sure that um, you pest proof your home. You know, in other words, you don't roll out the red carpet. You don't leave the door open, for example, mm -hmm. at nights, especially for rats and things to come in. You would close the door, you know. But in the, in the case of mosquitoes, of course, we need to have windows screened, mosquito netting, and of course, very important, um, I will keep saying this over and over, doing the weekly inspection, gotcha. covering water containers, anything like that. And I would say, don't be a procrastinator on it, mm -hmm. and don't be like me, because for a period of time, I had, um, this is so embarrassing, but the own vector people telling me you need to cover your water tank, cover your overflow pipes. And I was, I would look at these things and I would think, ah, oh, it can't be that big. But at the same time, I was bothered by mosquitoes mm -hmm. at my home. Mm -hmm. And so eventually, um, a few months ago, I did it. I had it done. I, right. I didn't do it personally, but I had it done. And it is amazing. I have no problems with mosquitoes now. They used to, the water tank was near the door. It used to be every time you open mm -hmm. the door, I mean, somehow, the mosquitoes were mm -hmm. there. So mm -hmm. I would say don't put it off, do it. And also don't be a hoarder. You know, some people don't want to get rid of things. They may have uh, sentimental value or whatever, but we don't need to collect things around the house that could store water. Um, that's a very big problem. And I would say use the same rule of thumb that I use at home in my own closet, mm -hmm. which is if I haven't worn it in six months, it's time to give it away. Right? And if something's in your yard that you haven't touched for the past several months, it needs to be gone probably. So for the householders, we need to remember that. Next, you asked about schools. schools and right? workplaces. Right. Mm -hmm. For schools, um, I indicated that we were asking for uh, the maintenance people to train. Yeah. And that's going to be great. But the other key part of that is we need the administrators for the schools to hold those people accountable. Mm -hmm. They need to be reporting back to the principal or the person in charge that the weekly, this is what's going on on the grounds. And I would even make, say we could probably provide some type of checklist or something that mm -hmm. they could use. But in addition to that, uh, where applicable, like with the secondary schools, if some students could be identified that could accompany the maintenance person, they could be trained as well. So that uh, down the road they could earn uh, community service hours, you know, for yeah. their work in, you know, ensuring that their school is a safe place. Kind of, kind of killing two birds with one stone. That's right. And then um, in the workplace. Yeah, workplace, mm -hmm. right. In the workplace, um, again, you know, it's just being aware of what is going on. Um, and I would say workplace and community, because workplaces are in communities. Right. Um, communities, too, can identify into individuals that can, you know, be trained. And we had a call for um, individuals to come out and identify themselves during the um, chikungunya, chikungunya um, outbreak. And so we do have a list of names and we are going to be tapping those individuals okay. saying that, you know, yes, please come forward and receive the training. And that person can kind of um, take on the hat of, um, you know, a vector control person for their particular community. In terms of these short-lived campaigns, we know around these times when we have chikungunya, when we have dengue, when we have Zika, we find that um, people become more aware at these times, but after that we go back to old habits right. and um, the mosquito population builds up again. What is the department's plan to really reinforce the need for this to be a year-round practice? Right. Well, as you say, unfortunately, when the hype dies down, we'll be back to normal, which is uh, normal for us is still vector control is doing their job. But what people need to realize is that the vector control officer is not, is not their job to come and, mm -hmm. you know, eliminate all of the breeding spots from your yard, like cover your things and remove your vehicles. We're there to advise and, you know, survey and give you instructions and things like that. So I would say uh, what is really needed is um, a sustained focus mm -hmm. and commitment to vector control and mosquito control. What we're doing now is um, <clears throat> if we can really put all that we have into this plan, we would be um, cutting off the breeding places for mosquitoes. So if the virus does come into the territory, it wouldn't be able to, 
you know, it would be very unlikely to spread because we've reduced the mosquito population. So the only way to, to keep it going is I'm hoping that, um, you know, people higher than me in the <laughs> ministry would keep the focus going and try to really build upon the uh, IMS DNA because we've kind of started it now by including schools and tourist board and, mm -hmm. you know, we've got um, the uh, airport authority involved and we've kind of started but we need to build on that. That's right. Thank you so much, Ms. Penn, for joining us today and um, hopefully persons would understand the need for them to play an active part in reducing yes. the mosquito population. Thank you. Thanks again. We'll be right back after this break. You're tuned in to FOCUS, a program by the Department of Disaster Management, DDM. We just heard from Acting Chief Environmental Health Officer, Yolanda Penn. So let's now turn to the Ministry of Health's Public Health Communication Specialist, Natasha Letsom, to find out what is being implemented to raise awareness about the Zika virus. Natasha, thanks for being here with us. Thank you for the invitation. All right. Uh, first of all, tell us what is taking place regarding the public awareness and education campaign from the ministry's standpoint. Well, from our standpoint, um, because we really don't know, there's so much unknown surrounding Zika, our aim right now is just to have information going out there. We want to empower persons with that information so they can make the decisions in terms of our key messages, which are personal prevention. We want you to, like Dr. Georges was saying, you know, pr protect yourself and protect your children from mosquito bites. And we want to like Mrs. Penn was saying, to clean up our surroundings and do these weekly inspections and train people. So definitely that's what we are looking at, sending out that information, promoting that information, basically trying to rally the troops to jump on the bandwagon to ensure that we reduce that vector here in the territory. Right, certainly. What are the key messages you're sending through your campaigns? Mm -hmm. Now, one, personal prevention. Like I said, we want to reduce mosquito breeding sites. We want to educate and inform vulnerable groups. And when we're looking at vulnerable groups, we're talking about the tourism industry. We're working with our tourism partners to, you know, encourage and inspire industry partners to, you know, have someone that will do these weekly inspections to reduce the mosquito population on their properties, respectively, and also to be, be more aware, to, you know, comfort the guests, maybe have repellents and other mm -hmm. things that could be at their disposal um, for the guests when they come. Mm -hmm. We're looking at the construction industry. We know that is one um, area that could be a big breed of mosquitoes, and we're trying mm -hmm. to you know, mobilize them and, you know, send the messages that we want them to reduce the, the breeding site on their, on their property, whatever um, house or whatever they might be constructing, to be aware, be vigilant, mm -hmm. to cover containers, to avoid breeding mosquitoes. We're looking at the schools, we're working with the schools. Actually, next week we're supposed to be going into um, Leonardo Delville to shoot a promotional video. So we want to, right. you know, encourage the students. We'll take them with us as we identify various areas on the school, you know, that would be potential breeding sites and how we remedy them. Teach the children to pass on the information right. so they too can, you know, be more vigilant and help with um, the efforts. And also we're looking at the fishing industry, you know, boats, oh. derelict boats. We spoke about derelict boats and derelict vehicles. Yes. and these harbor a lot of mosquitoes and so we we want the fishing industry to remain vigilant if you use your boat you know keep it covered you know make sure the water has a way to run off if if you're not using the boat perhaps turning it over or covering it with tarpaulin that's what we're looking at in terms of the key messages in educating vulnerable groups mm -hmm. then the transfer of knowledge where i spoke briefly on um mrs penn mentioned it earlier that you know, they are offering training. So for yeah. tourism partners, any group or anyone representing a group that is willing to be trained, they will contact the, the environmental health department to get that service done to help promote a sustainable movement. You know, right. like I know you, you spoke of earlier that, um, you know, this is the latest fad. Mm -hmm. And once it dies down, then, you know, people might be back to their ways of breeding mosquito, but we're exactly. trying to inspire a change of the paradigm. We want people to you know, keep it on the forefront long after Zika has passed. How are you distributing the messages? How are you getting the messages out there? Well, right now we have a lot of mediums we're going through. Um, recently we did uh, a similar program where we had Dr. Georges and 
this is spent on the program basically informing the community about Zika. Mm -hmm. And um, recently, Dr. Pada issued a statement on Zika that was also circulated. We have about two, and we're working on a third brochure okay. that we actually, when we go out to the house to house, inspections and you know wherever we go we would leave this information with persons so they could get acquainted read up on it and one of the one of the instruments we're going to use also is the the checklist so we want to distribute the checklist to you know various persons in the community so they have something to reference when they do go out and do these types of um, surveillance in their properties. Would the Ministry of Health be continuously sending out messages throughout the year to prompt or remind people to keep reducing mosquito population and um, preventing mosquito bites? Is well, that part of your plan? Definitely, it's a part of the plan. Okay. It's ongoing because normally we do send out things with fogging and what's not, but we're trying to really instill in the minds of the people that fogging alone cannot help. Yes, it helps to, you know, the nuisances of mosquitoes when there's a lot in the air. You know, you, you want people to fog, and mm -hmm. I understand that. Mm -hmm. But if, if we don't have those other preventative measures in place, then fogging becomes useless. Yeah. And it only gives you ease for one or two weeks. So we definitely need that paradigm shift that I spoke of earlier. And we really want to encourage persons to, to get on the bandwagon and, and look out for your neighbor. If you know you, you live next to someone who may be in a vulnerable group, an elderly person mm -hmm. or somebody that's incapacitated, you know, lend a helping hand, you know, do a little surveillance on their yard because the mosquito in their yard will affect you. So we want to promote that togetherness during right. this campaign. Ms. Letsom, thank you for sharing the Ministry of Health's education and awareness plans with us. My pleasure. All right. And thanks for tuning in to this edition of Focus. I am Viona Alexander-Smith, Information and Education Manager at the Department for Disaster Management. I hope this program has given you a better understanding of the Zika virus and the preventative measures we can all take to fight the bite and reduce mosquito breeding sites. Join me next time for another edition on CBN Television and on 90.9 FM.